This is Secrets to Win Big, your roadmap to sustained growth. Brought to you by Arjun Sen, founder and CEO of Zen Mango, top brand growth driver and a former Fortune 500 executive who has been called one of the most marketing intelligent minds in the business. Find him at zenmango.com. And now, here's your host, Arjun Sen. Hi. Welcome to Secrets to Win Big with Arjun Sen. This is Arjun. And I really look forward to these conversations because I get a chance to speak to leaders from all over the world and all walks of life. Today, in that spirit, it's truly my honor and pleasure to welcome my VIP guest today, Jaspreet Randwal. Jaspreet has a very unique career, and she has been a fintech entrepreneur and a CEO for Windis Fight Foundation. She founded a global software platform for, un, for anti-money laundering. And that platform does due diligence and is simultaneously involved with the foundation to help combat human trafficking. Over the more, last 20 plus years, she has had incredible impact as at the highest level as executive experience for global financial services technology industry and has extensive experience leveraging different technologies and their application to solve business problems. You know, the thing that really wowed me is in the business side, most of us have read Simon's book on Start With Why. Just really takes that to the next level where she not only starts with the core purpose, but when I got a chance to work with her, I really love the way she inspired everyone in the team on why we are doing that, which makes the journey so much more fun and easier. Jaspreet, truly a pleasure. Welcome to Secrets to Win Big. Thank you, Arjun. Really appreciate the invite. So Jaspreet, as you start looking at you know, your career back, of course, congratulations on an amazing career. And of course, the best is right ahead in the next years ahead. In your career, you have been passionate about anti-money laundering due diligence. What got you into this space and why is this so near and dear to your heart? Sure, absolutely. So my career actually started, I'll just actually take a few more steps back. As you know, I'm Indian, so I was supposed to be a physician. So of course I disappointed the family because I said I wanted to go into business. And not only business, I wanted to go into sales because it was very important for me to make money when I was young. So, uh, and that's what I did. And in that process, I wanted to learn the financial services business. And that's actually what brought me to America for which I'm so grateful. And I learned the business literally from scratch. So when I arrived in America, I literally was an investopedia looking up what is a futures contract. I had no idea. Hmm. I learned the business so along the way, even Though I had a job, I'd sort of crafted my own entrepreneur role in every company I worked at where I would ask them that, you know, I will work with all the clients who will never do business with us and let me go work with them. And then once I brought them home, I would move on to the next thing. So somehow being an entrepreneur, I think, just ran in my blood from the very start. So along that journey, one of the companies I worked with was in the anti-money laundering space. And to me, that was one of the most exciting places to work at. It was, uh, I won't go into the history of the company, but uh, unfortunately that company went under, but I met some absolutely fabulous people I'm st still friends with till now. But that business was absolutely unbelievably amazing to me because I did not know that uh, how much of money is actually laundered every day. And the people who launder money, like oftentimes we hear money laundering and we are so used to it. We are so immune to so many terms. It's just like, you know, talking of so-and-so got murdered and we say, oh, okay, and we move on. We have just become so, so and money laundering is the same. We just say, oh, okay. And everyone thinks they know what it is. And people think, oh, someone stole a lot of money to buy a yacht. Hmm. And the reality is some really bad things happen when money is laundered. In fact, the top three biggest crimes in the world happen with dirty money. And that gave me a really 
close look into what that business was all about, but then I moved on to doing other things. And soon I wanted to do something on my own. And I heard someone talking that, you know, there are a lot of ways to um, accumulate wealth in this world or do this, or, you know, feel successful or feel accomplished. But it's also great if you can do something really good along the way. And that is what true accomplishment is and that true peace is, which is so true because even in my life up till now, you know, you do simple gestures for someone and selfishly you feel so good about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how we are built as humans. As much as we all act, we're all really tough and thick skin and all of that. And we're all that. But when you do a small little thing for someone, whether it's a child or an older person or literally anyone, it's just, it just makes you happy. So when I was looking to do something, it's, I was looking back at my life up to that point And I thought of all the things I've done up to now, the thing that got me most excited was the space of AML, Anthony Laundering. And the reason for that was because of the impact it makes. So because in the financial services world, every technology is there for, you know, okay, we're going to create efficiencies and lower costs and improve productivity. Like it's pretty much the same pitch when you filter it down. But this was one technology that actually is way outside of financial services. It's in there, but the impact is way outside there. To It impacts people who don't even know what AML is. So sorry, I gave you a really long-winded answer to your question. No, I think I really appreciate that. And I want to go back to something you said very casually at the beginning of this conversation. When you joined in your early career, part of your career in the financial services industry, one of the things you shared with pride is you were winning back clients who were lost to the company. What was your secret? How were you doing that? That's one of the toughest thing anyone can achieve that too in the financial world. Right. And it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, I mean, I, uh, my very, very first job was with Xerox and they taught you, you know, in the old Xerox used to really teach and invest a lot of money in people and all these sales skills and this and that. I'm a big believer. It's, it's a little more, it's really more of a gimmick. You know, you go through these steps and all that. And I think it's really in you, people do business with people. And oftentimes we forget that. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets so focused on, oh yeah, but we're gonna save you X, Y, Z. But a lot of times, you know, we are so focused on the trees in front of us that we forget the massive forest. And the one thing that worked for me all the time was just building that amazing relationship. Like there were times I didn't even ask for the business. And I think that's where it makes a difference where you generally care for one the individual you're working with, or it's never usually one person, it's individuals. Let them trust you and you trust them, but it has to be authentic. If you're lying, you're gonna, you know, you might win once or twice, but you can't, lying is just a burden. You know, you gotta remember it. It's just, it's not my cup of tea at all. So you have to be authentic and genuinely care. I genuinely like people. I generally enjoy people. I literally like talking to strangers. So it sort of came as a second nature to me. But then just becoming friends with some absolute strangers. And there were times when I walked away from business where I said, you know, we're not a good fit. I mean, I've, I've probably done that twice with some two very large pieces of business. And then years later, they actually came back with something else where they wanted to call me. And this time they trusted me 1000%. So I think that trust factor that oftentimes we take for granted and we think, oh yeah, trust. But to me, trust is paramount and a lot of my friends say you're so rigid but I say trust is one thing it's zero or 100 percent there's no like I trust you 70 percent then it's zero there's no middle ground in that and with me just building that trust was so important and I think that's led me to you know there were there were clients that walked in and they didn't want to talk to our company at the time and at the end of the day you know we were best friends most of my clients most of my friends in this country are all my clients, actually. Wow. And you know, you talked about Xerox, and for me, it's really long, long, long time back. When I just started my career, I started at Pizza Hut those days. They sent me to a conference, and it was a sales training conference in Rochester, New York, in Xerox. And it was in the middle of winter, and you know, to me, it was a disaster place to be. But I learned something amazing there. And whoever the senior VP was came and talked to us about what networking meant. He explained to me 
that networking to me is about giving. And he gave us a three-step process. He said, over the next few days, every person you meet, any information they give you, take it seriously. Then do not discard any person. Because many a time what happens is I meet Jaspreet, I see she's in financial tech at the highest level. I may think based on my limited knowledge, she's not useful to me and just whoosh you. He said, no, every relationship matters. First get to know the person, then every relationship matters. And then the third thing he told me was gold was find out two or three things you can do for the person in the next six months. And that's what networking is. And all of us were somewhat perplexed. And then he gave us an example. He said on the final evening of this conference, we'll have the best gala dinner you, have, you will ever have. But the best dinner will happen only when during the next one and a half days, each one of you find out the best favorite food for five other people. And then there was the cool system, we wrote it down. And all of a sudden on that night, Jaspreet, it was so cool to have so much of different kinds of food. But the very fact others cared about, it was an incredible way they showcased to us how caring. So sorry to digress, but you took me back there. I really had to get back. Yeah, no, wanted... not at all. It's, no, it's, you're right. It's, I remember. Unfortunately, I don't think they do it again because everyone was stealing Xerox people. Mm -hmm. but so they don't want to spend that kind of money but it's I did and even though I should have said it's a bit of a gimmick but I still date I remember uh, I was trained by rank Xerox I was sent to London to get trained and uh, they filmed us and till date I use that mannerism that how much do you move your hands where do you look and you never dare look at your watch mm -hmm. ever in mm -hmm. any like that's the most disrespectful thing and that's why it baffles me these days right you're in a meeting and people pull out their phone to respond to a text or they look at the eye watch and to me it's so and they're like maybe i'm really old-fashioned but to me it's just you do not do that because it's over the moment you do that totally totally so now going back to anti-money laundering and in the due diligence behind it you know as i'm listening to you the thing that hits me is in any profession, I see people perform at three levels. Level one is people who are really good at what they do. And of course, as you shared, you are absolutely awesome. One of the best, maybe the best in anti-money laundering area. Then the second dimension, if you add from X to a Y axis, you started having fun doing it, found a passion. Because I think that's very important. People who are just good, I think it's okay. But when people start having fun in that because they feel that this is the niche. And then the third part, this is what you know. I really feel is wow and impressive about you is, you've added the third dimension, which is making an impact. Because the statement that you said, I wrote it down right away, was very, very powerful to me, was something, even the smallest thing we can do for somebody else, the real impact, that's what makes us happy. I truly appreciate you sharing this. Okay. So could we get back a little bit on onto the anti-money laundering initiative, anything specific you're talk, you can talk about and then get into how that got into you into with this fight, fight foundation. Right, absolutely. So I started working on, you know, researching that space, even though I knew it really well, you can never be, you know, you can never think you know it all. No one does. Even the ones who know it all don't know it all. So I was researching that space and I found that there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of broken processes in this process that has existed for over 50 years. And unfortunately, a lot of people have the mindset, well, this is the way we've always done. Well, that doesn't make it right just because we've done it that way. So uh, what I actually uh, took the plunge. I moved to Washington, D.C. I didn't know COVID was going to happen, but that was the reason I'd moved here. And that was actually to start speaking with the regulators because 
I had an idea of how it can be sold mm -hmm. uh, on the due diligence portion of it. And Adam money laundering is a really broad topic, like you monitor transactions, you monitor people. I'm more on the people monitoring and the entity monitoring because I, my belief is money is not dirty. It's how people use it and earn it that makes it dirty, right? Money is money. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and that's where I, I devised this process and we are actually building this technology right now. And I am, I'm probably one of the luckiest people in the world and I say it all the time. My friends say I'm arrogant, but I say literally, God made me in a long weekend because I'm so lucky that I've met all the right people along the way. And just this month, we started building this technology on a blockchain platform. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be global. It's going to create that ultimate transparency for the regulators. And because of that, one of the regulators we've spoken with is actually the one that looks at financial crimes. That's all there, not all there, that's a pretty massive role. So when we spoke with them, and I spoke with them about the whole process of how it is going to work and Mind you, it took me eight months to get in front of them because it wasn't an easy task. And uh, But the biggest thing we said why we're doing it, our true north, is that we are looking at financial crimes. And a financial crime very close to my heart is human trafficking. And like I said, there are many financial crimes. Human trafficking is one of the fastest growing ones. And that's where, and I think the, the reason I wanted to address that actually helped fine tune what we were going to build as a technology platform as well. Hmm. And it also got the attention of some of the most senior regulators who you need in this space. In financial services, you're doing anything, you better get blessed by the regulator. And just because what we're trying to do, or I shouldn't say we are going to do is so massive in scale that we wanted that blessing right from the start and wanted to see if we can even do it. But the impact portion of it is what actually magically drove what we were going to do. That how will it address human trafficking? How is that? How is money made and how is money owned there and how is money spent there? Because you can make dirty money, but to wash the money, you got to put it in regulated entity. So how does that work? And that helped define our technology as well. So that's where what we're building right now. Yeah, there, you know, what I wanted to build on what you just said is there are two parts. One is you talked about, of course, the super competence that you and your team have on knowing how to reverse this money laundering that is going on. I want to go into the second side is you and I, without mentioning names, we have all seen a lot of nonprofits which stays and, you know, my incredible vocabulary doesn't give me any other words other than to say it stays at a very foo-foo level where cool people meet together, have a few glasses of champagne, they do a presentation, they think about, you know, this world needs that, and the world doesn't change. Under your leadership, how have you shaped and is shaping the foundation to make real impact on individuals in the journey forward? Absolutely. So um, one, I agree with you, and it's quite unfortunate that uh, you know, you hear a lot of talk about altruism and you see all this and then it's, you know, just a lot of talk and really nothing happening there. I always say there's so much money in the, in the world and there's so much food in the world and why do people, why do small kids especially go to bed hungry? There's no reason for that, but it happens. And the same way for human trafficking. I knew about human trafficking when I was two. Not that I knew the words, but I was told, you live in a bubble, you step out, you'll be kidnapped. So I lived in a bubble all my life. And even now, it's, you know, I'm careful. You know, you have to be careful. You just never know who you're talking to. But uh, so when this fight, uh, we're still a very, very young organization. And my goal never was actually that, oh, I'm going to go create a nonprofit and run a nonprofit. It's, uh, I just happened to land in it. I met this absolutely wonderful lady who, was, who actually created this foundation when this fight. And the intent of the foundation was to create awareness for human trafficking. So I met with her and I said, wow, it, it sounds lovely, that's great. And uh, she'd heard me speaking on stage about how we would address human trafficking. And I was talking really at a general level of financial crimes and I mentioned human trafficking. And she asked me if I would join her and I said, probably not because uh, there are a lot of organizations creating awareness. How much awareness do we need to create? Everyone knows what human trafficking is, but we're not doing anything. 
And she said, what would you do? And I said, well, what I'm doing is what I would do anyways, because I'm creating a FinTech that will address it. Does it help being attached to a nonprofit? Probably. But so, so she was like, well, we should probably start working together and how, why don't you help change our strategy? So I got involved at the strategy level for in the beginning. And of course, because I'm also a bit of a workaholic and a perfectionist, I get involved deeper and deeper until then she said, well, why, why don't you just, you know, why did you become a CEO? And I said, I'm absolutely not a CEO material for a nonprofit. I come from the most capitalist world. But then I got involved in it. And uh, unfortunately, and I won't say her name just to respect her privacy, she uh, retired um, last year, towards the end of last year. And the next thing I had this nonprofit. So we fine tuned the strategy of what we're going to do. I have a company and the, my one big goal is, to your earlier point is that a lot of time there's such a bad reputation attached to nonprofits. Like people just think it's like a way to kind of really move money around, unfortunately. Now, when this fight was nothing like that, it was literally very cleanly run organization. But now we are saying, okay, I already have a company that I'm building for fighting anti-money laundering and it has an impact. So we didn't win this fight. We want to keep our direction very clear and any funds we raise, we want to use it, obviously not with anti-money laundering because that's a separate company altogether. So when this fight has a liaison with a fintech company, but we don't want any money transfer in it because it just makes things messy. But when this fight will raise funds in order to then maybe help some survivors, maybe I'm a big believer in education. I think the gift of education is the best gift you can give anyone. You give money for food and shelter. I mean, that's all great, but education lasts with you forever. So we want to, the funding we will do would be actually for helping these very unfortunate people with the gift of education. Uh, so that's where we are. So, and again, like I said, we are a very, very young organization. And um, after the previous person left, we had to kind of rehaul a whole bunch of things. And, um, you know, oftentimes with people, a lot of people are involved because of a specific person and then they don't want to be there. So one thing I always speak with my team is that be here if your heart is here, don't be here for me. Because what if I'm gone tomorrow doesn't mean you all leave. I mean, that's not what it's supposed to be. Nothing is, and no one is forever. So you have to be here for the cause and not for a specific person. Love that. And you know, one of the things I have seen is organizations are very different than human beings. And each person's role in an organization is incredibly important. But somehow organizations, just like, you know, if you pour water, it'll find a way, is more important than you and I individually or combined. And even though I may feel a lot of ego by saying what will happen to the organization, organizations find a way and they evolve, they evolve. And at that point, you know, past contributions never vanish, but they literally send the stepping stones for future success as you start going through. And, you know, I just want to quote three numbers I have learned from you that I think have been very, very powerful in this particular field. And, and again, you know, to me, human trafficking was again, at a very simple level, bad, scary, but till you connected the dot and shared with me every 27 seconds on an average, one more person falls victim. And that freaked me out. And then when you shared based on, again, you know, incredible sources, which I cannot quote at this instance, but they are out there, is nearly 90, 95% of people who fall prey don't find a way out. And the third was, even those who come out, there's not that much tools for them to get back to some kind of a normalcy because I don't think life is never normal again. And I really, really love the way the FinTech company is helping reduce the first two numbers, the 27%, every 27 seconds, the number should be zero and that's brilliant. 
But I also love how when the fight at the end is working on those who are going to come out of this, and you know, we are very lucky that we get them back. How to get them back included in the life. I really love that education. So kudos to you and your team as you start going into this. So I just want to take this conversation a little broader. Okay. Yes, you know, your family wanted you to be a doctor. Yes, you wanted to be in finance. Okay. But I really think you wouldn't have got excited about win this fight foundation unless in your DNA, this give back is very strongly there. So where did that DNA come from? Is there inspiration you are comfortable talking about? So what made Jaspreet this give back Jaspreet? Right, it's, you know, I was, um... Somebody else asked me that question recently. And it, I think it was since I was a kid, it's, uh, I mean, I'm a big believer we're selfish human beings. And that's why I'll say, I think it was selfish when even as a little kid, I was a very pop, you know, high school is a very difficult place for everyone. And I went to an all girls school. So you can imagine it was very, very tough because you are not only from the academic perspective, but everyone's always like measuring you up, even the students, like it's just a tough place. Uh, and I used to like any time if there was a new kid in the school or, you know, sitting alone who no one was playing with or something, I would go and bring that kid in. So somehow I just had this. And of course, I made that kid happy. But I realized at a very young age that when I did something like that, it made me happy. So I was like, wow, this is actually really good. This is a really good trade. I make the other person happy. It's not close to me anything. And then it makes me so happy. And then everyone else is looking at that. So it was, and that's why I say, I think it was a very selfish thing I was doing for myself, but I was actually helping so many people because then a lot of other kids starting doing that. But I always hated, I just never like anyone being left behind because of any reason, there is absolutely no reason. I mean, you can't at any given point say you're not smart enough on what basis can anyone make that statement? You don't know what the person knows or, oh, you're not, attractive enough so you can't hang with us. And that's what happened, unfortunately, in high school. So somehow it was always there in me. I, had, I was like Robin Hood. I didn't want anyone to be left behind. And I've done that throughout my life. You know, to any extent I could help someone. Like when, when I was working, um, I was in the FinTech side, but I helped so many of my colleagues who were on my team to say, you know what, you've grown up, you've grown up enough in this company. I'm gonna help find you a job in a certain bank or do this because I had that massive network. And I did that so many times. And uh, I have these absolutely loyal friends and, and not that I'm, I demand loyalty from them, absolutely, but they, they didn't ask for it. I just volunteered and said, let me do this for you. And it's, uh, so I think it was just in me and I don't know if you speak Urdu, um, Arjun, I don't know, but there's a really famous uh, saying in Urdu and I'll say it and I'll translate it, which my mom actually said to me and it says, um, and in English I'll dilute it, but it basically means make yourself so great that God himself comes and says, uh, tell me what your wishes. And I think that was something I kept at the back of my mind that, you know, everyone prays and is always asking God for something or asking, and God is one example, but people are always expecting things from other people. But once you start giving, even if it's small things, like as in high school, I didn't have money to give or even I don't even today, I don't have, you know, lots of money to hand out to people. But these small gestures go such a long way and some things that don't even, you know, they don't have to cost you time or money where you're literally introducing somebody, someone else, and you just don't know where that will lead to. And I think that's what comes back because I was like, all right, I'm not going to ask people for what can you do for me? Something that you said earlier as well. Keep, keep giving, keep doing things for people. And you have no idea how it's going to come around. In fact, Steve Jobs said something really famous and he said, it's all about connecting the dots. And I was thinking about this morning, uh, like Ken, he was talking of how he, uh, his story was how he got involved in uh, Pixar films. Mm -hmm. You know how he took a class. And, but I was thinking in my life, something great is happening right now. And I wouldn't have gotten there if I didn't speak to one person randomly, let me to another person. And what's happening today is almost 60 connections away. But when I connected the dots, I would have never gotten there. But it was literally where I'm at. It was more like, what can I do for you? As opposed to 
what can you do for me? And then I'll spend time with you. And I think that's just a wrong attitude. And I think, you know, that's the part where, you know, recently, as I was reflecting on life, and I've gone through quite a few surgeries, I was just going back, how I have managed to get through life. What I realized, it's not me who got through. It's bizarrely at somewhere at every junction of life, there was a Jaspreet who would show up from nowhere. And without that person, I wouldn't have been able to cross that bridge. Okay. And after that, that person and myself, we are still good friends. But what that person does not understand, that for him or her, it was a tiny gesture. But my right life would have been a dead end or totally different without that person. And that's the part where going back to that high school just free, who sees that one kid who is being left out of the group, you walking and including, for you, it's a tiny gesture. But that makes that kid go home happy True. instead of even pushing herself that I should even come back to school tomorrow. Like next morning, the kid could be faking, I'm not feeling good or anything. Like you change the whole thing. And that's the part where I really feel that these small actions that you're talking about, the value to the receiver is 50 to 100 times more. And I truly appreciate how you know, you're going through and doing this. So now just read, let's look a little bit forward in a totally different way. So all of a sudden, you see a meeting on your calendar. But this meeting is with Jaspreet, 17 years old, you, and Jaspreet, 100 years old. Where will this meeting happen? And what will each person say in that meeting? Oh my goodness, uh, this is, wow. That, that would be fabulous, first of all. If a 16-year-old or 17-year-old, uh, I wish it was in America, it was in New York City. And um, I would tell this, oh my goodness, I would tell the 16, I didn't have the resources that are available to a 16, 17-year-old today. I would be literally, I mean, I love studying anyways, I'm a bit of a geek, but, uh, the amount of knowledge there is, if we first find your passion mm -hmm. and then know everything under the sun about it, but also start, like we talk of networking, start that early. Start that very, very early in life because you don't know where it's gonna take you. I mean, I've traveled so much in life. I grew up in India, I went to school in England, I lived in Canada, I'm here now, I've lived in many other places. And uh, so when I came to America, I was like, I don't have any childhood friends and I miss that. So that is what I would tell the 17 year old that cherish those relationships and find a way to hang on to it because it's important. I mean, end of the day, that's all we have. Yeah, the family is very important, but as you grow up, your family gets bigger and your family members are not usually, you know, you don't have to be related by, by blood. But the biggest thing I would say is look at all the resources in front of you. Look at the opportunity. Don't become one of the sheep do and and follow the best and i don't know what the 17 year old would say to me <laughs> i think would probably say why aren't you doing this that and the other or what else are you going to do i think a 17 my 17 year old would be so demanding so many times i wish i had a magic wand and i could literally you know start and i know everything i know today how great would that be and the 100 year old i wish we are um, still in india because i think of my grandparents none of four alive unfortunately but they had such a happy peaceful and fulfilled and healthy life which we don't have today you know they had neighbors and they all talked and they went for walks together and things happened here everyone is and I, I haven't been back to India in a long time so but I doubt it's the same as I'm trying to envision but it's they knew how to live so I would actually ask them, I would ask the 100 year old me that, how did you do it? How did you stay at peace? How did you stay balanced? Because as much as I try, I'm not balanced. You know, I, I sleep for three to four hours a day and it's not normal. Mm -hmm. And I'm stressed and it's up and down. I get stressed, I go work out, then it's back to work again and it's phone calls. And how did they do it? They had a great life. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have all of that. 
How did they live happily? And they had true relationships, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They're true friends. They didn't need to be, they didn't need to text them every 10 minutes. So I would love to ask them that. And I would, that, I think that advice would be priceless for me today. I love that. So just really, this is a fascinating conversation. Truly appreciate this. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you want to add? And also it's only fair you answered every question I asked. Is there anything you want to ask me? I'd actually love to ask you, Arjun, is, um, you know, what if you met, like Arjun was 17, like what advice would you give to 17 year old Arjun today? Uh, that life never gets easier, okay? So anything you want to do, do it today. Like I'll give you a simple example is when I was married, we wanted to have a kid. We always thought that, you know, let life settle down a little bit more and then, but I really feel that the only guarantee in life is uncertainty, which means you really need to mentally stay calm through the whole process and be in the present today because, you know, of course, I know a little bit of Hindi, which gets me into Urdu, I could understand. You know, the same way in Hindi, there's a saying, jo kal kare to aaj kare, to aaj kare to ab, which means what we were supposed to do tomorrow, why can't we not do today? And if it can be done today, it can be done now. And what's bizarre was it took me years when I met one of the top golfers on this planet. And I asked him, what's the difference? Like what happens on days you win and what happens you don't win? I was expecting him to talk about, you know, golf skills, I'm feeling good, this. He gave me a totally bizarre answer. He said, days I'm on a zone origin, I know at every instant what is the only one thing I must focus on. Everything else just goes on a database. And I was not getting it. He said, Arjun, as I walk, I feel every bit of the ground. As I chew gum, I chew gum. As I have the peanut butter sandwich, I can feel my daughter making them, wrapping them, putting them in my bag and telling me, Dad, third hole, sixth hole, ninth hole, twelfth hole, fifteenth hole. Do not forget. And after the eighteenth hole, you will eat a meal. And then he said, when he looks at before a part, the grass, he said, Arjun, at that point, the grass blades become bigger. Every drop of water says, hey, see me, I'm right here. That's what focus is. But I have heard about focus, but that's the part where connecting the dot, I just realized that being in the present, doing that only thing I can do right now is the way to bigger success. So to me, I would tell that distracted, super attention deficit Arjun by saying smack you on the head, dude, focus on one thing and don't ever doubt yourself. Like, just do it. So I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. No, that's actually, that's actually really, really profound. And the one thing you said, uh, something I talk about all the time is when you said the one thing that's for certain is uncertainty in life. And um, I was, um, I always say that there's a really famous quote that if everything is under control, you're not moving fast enough. Mm -hmm. Now this is by Mary Andretti and he's talking of driving, but it's so symbolic with life as well, mm -hmm. right? It's, uh, it, it's, if it's under control, you're probably just sleeping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the only time when life is under control, but it shouldn't be. If you're doing anything at all, anything at all, yeah. it, it shouldn't be and it's okay. Yeah, and that's the part where, you know, you and other super CEOs I've talked to feel exactly that. They live on this perfect balance of being in control, but being on the edge. Their heart races because every day they are moving into uncharted territory. And if that doesn't make you anxious, that means you're being too safe and too cautious. But then there's the other side of them where they strongly believe whatever you throw at me, they will figure it out. And this is the part where another you know, incredible CEO taught me this thing is, 
Arjun, for you to move forward in life, every day you will get bigger challenges. In any big challenge, don't look at first, I have not done this before. Look at soon, I would have nailed this. And all you do is the first minute, day, weeks, hang in there, be patient, let it come to you. And believe that once you get the data points or anything, you'll figure it out. But don't get yourself out of the game in the first few minutes or don't freak out and resign. And that's something I think if you go back to when I started working with the top golfer in the world, first few days I was thinking, what the heck am I doing? But again, I just followed that advice, hang in there, Arjun. And you know, we all figure it out unless we pull ourselves out of the game early. And I really think that is so important is to live on the edge, to feel the discomfort, but again, have the confidence. I love that just you. are brilliant. So. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's, it's that excitement, right? It's, it's not work if you love it, if it's your passion. And if it's work, it's, gosh, that would be a very long life, mm -hmm. a really long and comfortable life. And in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll just say one thing, which I was, um, I was on a podcast recently and I was mentioning that when I moved to America, I heard this term TGIF. I didn't know what it meant. And I actually asked somebody, I said, what's TGIF? Because I'd seen this diner thing, but I'm like, mm -hmm. so um, they said, oh, thank God it's Friday. And I said, why are you thanking God? Because it's Friday. They said, oh, because it's a weekend. I'm like, oh, great. So what's happening on the weekend? Well, nothing. So why are you thanking the God? Yeah. Oh, because you, there's no work. And I thought, wow, what you do, you hate it so much that there's a term coined for that. And that's actually really sad. And you're bringing God involved. Yes. <laughs> like TG. So on Sunday, you're probably going to be miserable that you got to return to this. I was like, yeah. why don't you do something different? Mm -hmm. Because even when I had a job, I loved it. I loved going to work. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, to me, it was so foreign. I didn't know for the longest time what TGIF is. And people look at me like, how can you not know that? I was like, well, I'm not from here. Yeah. I know what it means today. And I, it still baffles me. And, and, not, and to me, that's another thing is very important is not knowing is not something negative. And that's the part where an amazing friend of mine is just starting a new job at a very high level. She does not know that much about that industry. And she was trying to hide it. I said, no, this is your chance. Bring your, like when you, when I ask you, I just breathe, I don't know this. If you don't answer and judge me, too bad. It's your problem, not mine. On the other side, this gives an opportunity for me to learn and in the process of knowledge transfer, we become best friends. So this I think is incredible. So just for this is a great conversation, truly appreciate this. And I have to confess, I should have said at the beginning, this should be a disclaimer. I'm an obscenely large fan of your accomplishments. And the reason I'm a fan is I look at myself to be a shareholder in Team Just Breathe. And Team Just Breathe not only has done awesome things, but will do even bigger things. And as your cheerleader and shareholder, I am right here rooting for you. You are simply awesome. Thank you for taking time. Oh, thank you, Arjun. I appreciate it so much. You've been listening to Secrets to Win Big with Arjun Sen, founder and CEO of Zen Mango, top brand growth driver and a former Fortune 500 executive who has been called one of the most marketing intelligent minds in the business. To learn more, visit www.zenmango.com. Share this podcast with your friends and subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts. 